Perfect. All right. So then uh, the algebra side, uh, we all know what an algebra is. And so here in the category side, it's actually this thing. And this is So there, there are two choices here, and I will get messed up. I just was talking to Sasha. There is a choice if you take F and G this way. Uh, if, you, if you do it this way, you take F and G, and then unfortunately this goes to, uh, to this. Or you keep the order, and then you have to switch those things. OK, so uh, I will call this the algebraic version. Or the one, uh, the two, three version. This is this one, two, three, four, and two and three are the same. If I switch it around, it's the one, four version. And uh, there seems to be not much difference, but there is a difference because here we also have modules and we have left and right modules. And uh, depending if I switch these things around, I will get left or right modules. So with the algebraic notation, I will talk about right modules. And with the categorical notation, you will get left modules. Well, the categorical notation would be uh, some more people where I can write, yeah, and I call it more. More uh, yz plus more xy to more X, Z, and this is F and G, and now they go to F composed with G, so that's fine. And you see this is the one, two, three, four. This is the one, four version where one and four are, um, are the same. All right, so this is so this uh, is already the, the table in the sense that I get to, but I should, somebody said this is, uh, so uh, what are modules? So modules will, so the modules will correspond to functors. Actually, so that's kind of interesting. And what's the upshot? Because so you can do whatever you can do for algebras. So algebras have nice constructions. Like for instance, the two-sided bar complex. Um, they have full fitted chains, bi modules. They have full fitted cold chains. They have actually the same thing the previous algebra. There's string topology operations. On these. So, this is well, many people, you know, um, maybe Silas and I, um, and I did something, and uh, Rivera. Uh, and well, probably K from for our time. Uh, Wang, 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 sorry about that. Uh, we we have some some uh, some things I'm looking at this. Then uh, next thing is you can do co algebras. And then you know you can uh, so we have the bar construction, which actually goes from algebras. Co algebras, maybe a co bar construction, and then actually, if you're careful, you end up with EG and you have bar co bar, so you can get free resolutions. Also, you can also take talk about Kachul stuff, quadratic things. And so on. So, and then the point is that if I can think of categories as algebras, I can do the same things. All right. 
So, and then there is sort of like theorem. So uh, let's see, so one kind of application, if you want, is there is a theorem that uh, by Duvalier, uh, which says that three bar constructions for operads are equivalent And the first one is the original one is the Ginsburg Caprano one. The second one is the one that uh, tests uh, the kind, which is the a resol triple resolution one. And the third one is the one that Muriel actually defined herself, Divani, and this is based on uh, comma categories, actually slice categories for that matter. And uh, this can be thought. So what's it? And then it's a nice theorem. So uh, this. So this is with my students, uh, Michael Monaco. And um, Mo Yang, which says this is also true, so this is true for any Feynman category. And I'll explain what this is. And uh, three is possible. If the Simon category, Simon category F, if F is the plus construction, if psi is long plus construction for some called well, UFC, so unique factorization category, and and this was sort of the night theorem. Uh, with Michael Monaco. Which uh, classified actually, which gave, there are several things. So there are plus constructions. Maybe I'm running out of space here. I'm plugging my student which in one little space. So first of all, So um, relative prime modules are co-represented by plus constructions We proved a lot of stuff, but this is what I need in this talk. And then these uh, the prime category F is uh, plus construction of some M if and only if M is a unique factorization category. And after here, we mean strong hereditary. All right. So I learned this from Wolfgang Lück. Uh, you said you should write the theorems first and then explain the <laughs> theorems because in the end uh, you don't have time to explain the theorems. So the rest of the time I'll spend time, uh, uh, the time to explain what the words mean and how this actually fits together. All right. And uh, since I have a representation theorist sitting here, uh, one way, I mean, so this is, this is there's, there, there's maybe two crowds, the operatic crowds, uh, so the story is about it's about uh, props. So they will appear props, operats, you can see, but you can also think about this as a story about path algebras and representations.
So it will also look like if you if you like uh, path algebras, you might as, if you like opera ads, everything inside is an opera. Ad. If you like path algebras, everything inside is a path algebra. All right, and and you'll see that up there. Like, okay, so now how should I think of a category as some algebraic object? And I pretty much had it on the board, so this was maybe zero was introduction. So one is now bimodules. Categories as bimodule models. So the first thing is uh, just an observation. If I have a category C, um, in the functor from C of cross C to E, and now E is symmetric phenomena enrichment And now I don't know everyone, so I don't know if you know what that means. And if you don't know what that means, it's not so important. Then think of E as set. So one more or less is, uh, says uh, I can take E as set or E as vect, A vector spaces, or maybe even BG vect. Um, so that means, you know, usually, or, you know, if you have the leading category E is ab, it just means you can add morphisms, right? So if this has more structure, usually the, the, mo the morphisms of X to Y are set, but maybe I can add them, maybe I can multiply them by a scalar, maybe you can differentiate them. That's what's called the rich category. And then composition should be in morphism in that category. All right, so let's just make a definition. A C by module in the functor from C up cross C by module in E in the functor C of well, C to E. Maybe, actually, maybe I will do an example so we see that we're actually doing representation theory. So why do I call that a bimodule? Let me do some just uh, we talked about this at lunch, representation theory. So say if you use a group, so you might as well take it finite or at least discrete at the moment. Uh, then uh, what do I have? I have a group action, uh, P cross V to V. And now actually my V is a vector space, but really action doesn't have to be, each E is a vector space. But if I have a group action, it could be on a set. I have a map like this. Um, I can also look at this as a representation, uh, which is a map from G to the automorphisms of V, which sit inside on um, V. So now we're now we're getting to this thing. So what is so this is kind of that's sort of the nice adjunction and hum of G cross V. V is hum. I mean, should I? It's hum G hum V V, right? So this is very important. I said there's only one. It's a uh, talk to Sasha. I said there's only one equation, the substitutive equation. But there is a second thing, namely it's mm -hmm. a hum tensor adjunction. So, mm -hmm. and I will say call something uh, uh, an action if it's on this side. And a representation if it's on this side. And I claim half of representation theory is this, and the fact that I can actually enrich over vector spaces. So there is something, maybe um, I can think about this, the other thing. So let me write enrichment here, and then I can enrich your life. So the point is from K, I can go to KG, and I know that um, G, um, so G action, so now I can. Uh, a G action is the same thing as, so if I go from, this is the same thing as going from KG tensor V to V, and now I tensor over K. 
And that uh, in general, what we will have is we will have functors. I'll have an E, which is my enrichment category, and I have a Z, which is tensored over E. So, and then maybe I'll ask a question over E, which means that, you know, E of, um, if I have something in E and tensor, E is monoidal, so there is a tensor, but now I tensor it with something illegal, namely, so something was D, so that means I have something from E cross D to E, and so that this D1, D2, there is this uh, formula junction is, uh, and now E from E um, D1, D2, and this would be internal harm, so that this is E. So this is enriched over E intended over E, and then I'm not going to say it again. But I want this uh, junction to hold. What I can do here is, so this is what happened here, this tensor over uh, over E meant, for instance, I'm taking G cross V. V is a vector space, G is just a set. But I can I can augment that into something in E, which is kg, and so then I'll take this vector space. So that's what's happening on the left hand side, and then I can put it to the right hand side. But on the right hand side, this home bv here on the right hand side, that should uh, then be the internal home, which means that's a vector space. All right, and if that's the first time you've heard it, that's actually already pretty good, and. Uh, I won't dwell on this, but it's the whole thing. If you if you think the the symbols don't really live where they're supposed to, this says I can make that happen. <laughs> and I'll use this in sort of like always this action and representation kind of. Okay, so it's either action or representation. And this was the, the so when I said that uh, functor is a module, module is action, functor is representation. All right, so that's that. Now, where am I? I have this out of our modules, by modules, that's where I am. So, ah, and then I want to explain one more thing. Maybe what does that have to do with what I'm doing now? And then if I have a hard, how in the world is this categorical, this is algebra, but I can make this categorical. I look at G underlined, so this is the groupoid, uh, which has objects, just one object, and home star star is G. And composition is group multiplication. It's a groupoid because this is invertible. But you know, it would be fine to take a monoid. But actually, that's not fine. I could take at least a unit of monoid. If I take a monoid, I can compose, and there will be a story about units. So if you read the papers with uh, Michael, they're terrible in the following sense that we deal, they're actually also really good for the same reason, mm -hmm. because we always distinguish if we have something unital, co-unital, monoidal, split, not split, whatever. And they're all different cases. It's just algebra. It's not, not everything is automatically split if you're enriched. Not everything is unital, and there are non unital operators, for instance. Not everything is unital. All right, so if I have a unital monoid, but I could also do A if this is, uh, and then it would be A, it would be K vector. So if I have an algebra, it's a K vector space, I'm enriched over A, over, over K vector, this is the algebra. And then if I look at the functors of my A bar into D, this is again, this is just A algebra. In B, if I do that, I mean, maybe I should do the first line. So just G and E, this is uh, G representations in E. How does that work? You know, star, if I have a function in here, called rho in here, then rho of star is V, for instance, if E is K vector spaces, that's my object. And then, uh, you know, rho of G, that's a morphism. Uh, this has to map, be a map from rho of star 
the row of star, but of course this is just V, so it's just a map from V to V. And if it's if it's invertible, then it's an odd V. So this is how representations are functors. Yes. Could you remind me what D is? Uh, D was some category which is enriched over E and tensored over E. It's just some other monoidal category, just so that I have enough room. Because I may, might want to talk about operats, uh, uh, algebraic operas, operas in k-vector spaces, for instance. If you're only concerned about set theoretical things or combinatorial things, all, all the E's and D's vanish and they just collapse to be set. So what is tensor over E? Tensor over E is exactly this, this equation. Oh. There is a functor from E cross D to E such that, so this is the tensor functor, the, the Hahn tensor injunction holds with the tensor product on E. So E in this case should be a closed monoidal category. Mm -hmm. And D is enriched over this, so that's an object of E. And sometimes that's also an it's called powered or I forgot if this is powered or co-powered powered, but if you look at any lab, it comes as powered or co-powered. But basically, I mean this is this this is a good example to think about. It's like, well, yeah, I had a vector space, I have a set, I can up the set by the free enrichment to kg, and then this is a vector space. Mm -hmm. And then how how this tensor thing has I have the tensor home injunction, so I can flip it over to the other side. I have to tensor over k. Yeah, right. Right, exactly. Cross goes to tensor over k. Mm -hmm. So that's I should say this gives me a, so having the free enrichment gives me such a construction. If I can freely enrich from B to E, I can do that. But it's just so that formulas hold. As I said, I want to go in between uh, representation and uh, action. And you see, I need the home tensor. Where did it go away? I have it. Oh, here it is. I need this attraction. That's all I'm saying. All right. So that's what it has to do with representation theory. And now finally, so I define this as a bimodule, and then you can see, ah, okay, so how is this a bimodule? In my example, I could have taken, so uh, literally a bimodule is something A up A, because then I get a right A action and a left A action, which is a bimodule. And then I could have also done it, so, so this is the categorical, so. And then I could do the algebraic version, which would be C cross C up, where algebraic it would be nicer to have a, uh, the right action on the right. And that's usually, that's an action, right? I mean, the A up goes on the right, if you, so this is, yeah. yeah. This is A E bar, so the universal, uh, sorry, the developing algebra, not yeah. universal, the developing algebra already. In Russian, you know, the catch it is here. Yeah. So, I don't know, are people happy with bar complexes and stuff like that? No? Well, I'll, some of us. Some of us. Sasha is happy. <laughs> I'm happy. It's a mix. I'm going to pay for I'm happy to hear about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, you'll see, you'll see it again. It will come back. But then I shouldn't dwell too much on analogies to things that people don't know. So that's, you know, it's always good if you learn in greater generality, you can always specialize to the other case. All right. So anyway, so op means but that one you learn the representation you pay course. This is the left action. And if you have a right action, it would look like this. But this is the same thing as going from G op. So left actions go from this, but this is the same thing as if you would have a left action from G op. And that's one of the most confusing things in mathematics and most painful. <laughs> there are two things that I wasted several months of my life on, and one is left or right actions versus right actions, and the other one is signs. Signs? Signs. <laughs> You're in that club. Yeah. I wasted my whole life on signs. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure. All right. So, so this is a bimodule. This is fine. So the next thing is actually um there is a monoidal product there's a monoidal monoidal product 
And then maybe in the analogy, you know, you take beam tensor KW, this is not just E, uh, like inject. And if you have if you have uh, uh, something with the left at right action, and uh, so if this has a left G action, no, this is right. If this has a right G action and this has a left G action, uh, then this is defined. And then usually uh, for bimodules, if you have an, uh, you have a tensor product in any a bimodules, which is your tensor over a, maybe. Which means that if I have the A tensor W, this is equal to, um, well, equivalent to um, D tensor AW. So there's an equivariant product. If I have left and right actions, I can either act on the right here or on the left there, and I say that it's safe. So this is D tensor over K with W modulus. All right. So I can do the same thing here. And then it gets a little more fancy, but it's the same idea. So, so if I have, and I'll just do the bimodules. So if I have two bimodules, uh, so row one and row two are uh, both functors, they're bimodules, so they're functors from G up to C up, C up cross C to some E actually in that case, oops. So E, this is defined to be uh, the row, and then I'm taking the one, uh, what did I decide? The one four, so the Z over Y, Y tensor. Uh, this is in, in E with row um, Y, and this is the one four version. So oh, that's sorry, this is the two three version. I want the one four version. One four. And and that just means that uh, this is now I'll, I'll give an example and then you see what this means. So this is notation for a co end. I don't have time to define what a co end is. You can open up uh McLean's practicing mathematicians or NLAB. Uh, but it actually, what the co end says is exactly this. I can act by A on the left or on the right, and it's the same thing. That's exactly what the co end says. And let me do an example here. Uh, I have my home C. I claim so if rho is home C, then I claim I have a monoid structure. So what is rho box rho? And so this should be still a bimodule, right? So this is something going from C up. Cross C to E, so I can evaluate that thing on some uh, X and Z, right? And what is this? This is the um, this let me go or set so either this is a different union of row of um, um, by Z. There's a row of um, y, x, x, y, or x, y, right? Because I'm going from x yeah, to y to z. And this is my f, f yeah. and, and this is my g, and then this is my f, and this is my g. So that's how you're supposed to read this formula. And then, uh, but then I said, well, this was, this looks pretty discrete. So this is not quite correct, correct. So let me write C discrete here. And then the formula is correct, but I'll have to explain this. Just to show in union. The other one is actually also the destroyed union, but that's straightforward. So what does this equivariance mean? So first of all, what is C discrete? So I will work on three levels namely box C for everything. Then I will work on box G, where G is a group void. And basically, if I start with a category, G is the isomorphism of C. And sometimes I go like this. 
uh, and I say C disk, where this is now C disk, there's a discrete category. Where the objects are the object of C, and the morphisms are just the identities. So that's how a set is a category to destroy identities. And so if I do this here, the only thing says that in this case, source is target. So the target of this is the source of that. And if I did the one three, it's actually nicer than the source, then the target of this is the source of that. But there. So this is. So, and, and what happens, why, why is it true also for these guys? And as I said, there's only one equation, so it must be that one. So it's the associativity equation. If I have an F, an H, and a G, and I do this, this is F, H, G. But what is this? This is the right action of H on F, and then composed with G. This is the same thing as F composed with the left action of H on G. So that means that it's actually equivariant with respect to all morphisms. Right, where the left action is, so left action, this is right action. The right action is pre-composition and the left action is post-composition. Yeah, it's like all of math suddenly comes together, cold contravariant functors. <laughs> so that's, that's what it is. Anyway, so this is, this is nice. So I see that this is kind of interesting. So this is a, this is a monoidal structure that produces from two by modules by module. So that's what a monoidal structure is. So uh, this nice theorem, I mean, actually, I know this should be known. Right? I don't know where it is in the literature. So actually, this is a, all these things are theorems of uh, monoclonal. Take this thing here, uh, this, this, and this are monoidal structures. On bi modules, well, you know, C out, C, G, or the discrete bi modules. In principle, I could have just said C, but I mean, since I'm talking about three levels, I wrote three things, but it's enough to do this for one category, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. So really, I only need, I only need this guy and this. The rest, uh, then C is G or C is C plus green. And uh, sort of with unit, rho, uh, now U is um, C or um, G or, you know, um, C is green, but depending on one of those three settings I'm on. So that's actually pretty cool because now I can. So I already gave you an example, which my example was maybe that's a lemma, a little proposition. If I have a category C, and um, set B equals to I C, then C, then row C, which is defined to be from C restricted to G op cross G, is a unit uh, a unit of uh, module one and I'll, I'll most of the time I'll stick to this middle level because that's the most interesting for applications in in uh, in operas, but I don't have to. Right, so how was that? Uh, well, what, what, uh, so I just gave it to you, right? Because this is just the, uh, what does it mean? I need a map, so what does it mean to be a monoid? It means I need a map, so what is monoid? Let me just write this here. I like your blackboards, they're actually pretty good. I always have stuff here. 
<laughs> well, I'm, yeah, reco so I'm recorded now. But <laughs> <laughs> Or do take notes. Our blackboards are not as nice. <laughs> so what does a monoid mean? Well, it means you go from row tensor row to row, and then maybe I should take a double arrow because this is a functor, right? It's a bimodule. That's a functor. That's a functor. So what's a morphism? It's a natural transformation. And what does unit mean? Well, I have my unit, and I should have a natural transformation to row. That means unit long. So you see, it's a tensor a goes to a and k goes to a. So, and then the whole the whole talk, or maybe the whole, the rest will be, I can just do the following thing. Every time I see an a, I write a row. And every time I see a tensor, I write a box. And that's the full talk. <laughs> because I can do a co-module, so I'm sorry, a co-algebra goes to the C tensor C. And so I know what the co-category is, is this, right? And then maybe here I want a co-unit. So then I want a co-unit. So you can define, so for instance, now I can define what, so for a C, I like to talk about co-categories. And all this is very confusing to me. And this is, of course, just a, it's a, P by module, um, monoid, co monoid. There's a co unit of G by module, co monoid. And maybe I'll give you an example of what maybe it's category. And uh, what this means is like, um, I take my row, I take this again to be Hong C, and what's the map that I take? I take delta of some morphism F. This is the sum over F tensor, F1 tensor F2, and then probably I did it wrong, but... So with a lot of thinking, you can figure out if it's F1 tensor F2, uh, F2 tensor F1. Uh, because it's either algebraic or categorical, and it doesn't matter because one is the opposite co-algebra, so it does matter. But and so what is epsilon of phi? This is one and phi in x and zero else. And so Möbius means that this is well defined; it's a finite sum, so so it's finite decomposition. So there is an example of a co-category for you: the dual of a finite decomposition. Category. And that's the same trouble you have with co-algebras and algebras and taking their duals. So how does it go? The dual of a co-algebra is an algebra, but the dual of, a, of an algebra is not necessarily co-algebra. That's why you need to take Hopf duals. Can I ask you a bit more yes. about this example? Well, while you were writing it up, you, you were in front of the thing, so I couldn't actually see what was going on. So you're, you're defining Mobius categories. Um, and what, like what, so uh, it, may, maybe I know those already, I, but I didn't know the name or something, but what are the objects? And could you say again? So it's a category with a condition such that the condition is that this state sum is finite. Uh -huh. So it's got a del, it, it has a, a, a co-product. It has a co-product. Um, and, the, and the sum has to be finite. It has, I mean, finite. It has no other option. Right. Um, it's simply that. It's simply that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So C would be a the members category. Yeah, and then um, so the so the example is uh, the path algebra. Maybe I could have said that before. So you an example of my algebra by a category is an algebra. If I have a quiver. This is just lunch conversation, so stop me anytime. This is just, <laughs> I'm modifying my talk live. So if you don't want it, so if I have a quiver, right, I have the path group of the quiver. So like a quiver is a bunch of, is a graph with, with some arrows. That's a pretty decent quiver. So A, B, C, D, E. And what's the, so this, there is a category for the quiver, uh, which has objects on the vertices. 
and then uh, the morphisms are uh, pad, and then source of target mass is a source of the first vertex, and these are oriented. So you're not allowed to go in the vertex. Uh, target is the last vertex. And these are words, and it is the empty word. So in this case, so this is this is nice, and then so this is a Möbius category. If this is a finite quiver, you you have to linearize the category, right? You yeah. To do, like if if you just start with the quiver, you form the free category. Yes. And then you have to linearize that, and the yeah. linearization is. Yeah. So the dual, if if yeah, you have to write it. So you're completely right here. I'm 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 taking the free. Is easy. Oh, yeah. Exactly. For the sum to make sense. For the sum to make sense. And now we're in this thing where I sometimes need in red. Right. Exactly. You're right. Yeah. And the funny thing, otherwise, it's a partial thing. So this is very important. The remark is a very important remark. As a category, I need to use at least the C discrete, right? Because source has to be target. So it's a partial composition. It's not really an algebra. If I linearize it, that's what algebra is like to do. I can say if I can't compose it, it's zero. But if I don't linearize it, it's still over this thing. Um, then going backwards, I have to linearize because there is a sum. But then it's actually also just a co-algebra, not just a partial gadget. And the last remark is, well, you know, if I have something like this, and maybe um, Maybe I take it over the isomorphisms. Now I don't need this sum to be finite anymore because as soon as I have isomorphisms in my category, this will not be finite. I can always take a lot of isomorphisms. Well, I mean, that's not quite right. I mean, but automorphisms. Automorphisms. Yeah. Automorphisms. Right. Yeah. Uh, infinite order automorphisms. Yeah. Okay, that, I mean, I, I'll have uh, isomorphisms will cause you a lot of headaches in these things. And there you just throw in the isomorphism, you don't have any problems. All right, so that's categories and co-categories for you. So let me see, I don't have too much time, five minutes, I guess. Um, so maybe I can, so maybe I'll just make it, I think so. Uh, maybe here it's, uh, all right. Um, so with this thing, so if you take the C discrete, so this is what uh, Holstein, Lazarev, and Holstein look at. And um, also Rivera with Steinayan and Ron. So when they talk about co-categories, they take it over this discrete thing, and then um, this is what usually is called co-tensor. So maybe. I'll do a little bit, I think a little bit quicker. So, uh, so now, um, maybe, okay, so I need, you can go back if you, I have this row box row, row, so, and this uh, U to row, then I can define a category C row where the objects of C are the objects of my G. And I can define, um, um, of x and y, this is row of x and y, and this mu here, let's call this mu, uh, mu gives the composition. And I, I didn't say associative. So my all my monoids are associative, okay? So I get that. This has some extra data, and you can ask me, this has extra structure of this G action. And there are two ways to think about this, either as a two category, as a thin two category. I won't explain, you have to ask me, or as a category of group points. So um, I know a little bit more. If it's just C discrete, not G, then it's just literally a category. If I have actions of C or some automorphisms, and I don't know that because nobody told me that, you know, this row is actually my C. Ah, and then maybe actually this is kind of nice. So now I can actually see what um, 
uh, now I can ask, uh, right? So um, P by modules are are a category. So I can ask. So here's like one of the theorems that could be proved is Michael Monaco. Uh, I can ask what the slice category over a given row is, and this is equal to the functors of the uh, plus construction C of rho plus functors out of the plus construction, where this C of, C of rho plus is this by Dolan type plus construction. Defined in um, and if I'm really careful, this has to be a uh, whole unit of whole unit of functors. But this is again, if you're enriched, you have to be a little bit careful. If you're non Cartesian enriched. So I will take my five extra minutes to connect this to operas because they haven't appeared anywhere. Props and operas have not been there. What's the first point in the theory? The, the, the comma category. So it's oh. uh, the over category. Or oh, it was C, C period like, for, for the comma? Or? Well, it's a down arrow. So no, this is OK. Oh, OK. This is a slice category. So maybe 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 this is better. C, uh, so G, I mod over row. Mm -hmm. I can ask, if I want to know the category of bimodules, I can ask about the size categories. Mm -hmm. And they're co-represented by this plus construction. So it actually is, also explains what the plus construction does. <laughs> but that's what it is. All right, so to hook up to opera ads, Go to props. Well, I mean, what is props is the product and permutation category. So this is a product. So this is McLean. We're getting very old here. So the whole point is though, uh, and I want to make this point. So uh, at the end, now I have. Thank you for the extra talk. <laughs> talk goes on by the fearless dedication of grad students to the mathematical. Enterprise. So this means that I have a category with a monoidal product. I don't have this yet. So what is a monoidal product? So you know you have this thing, right? I mean, this, as I said before, it's like V tensor W. So I have something from C cross C to C. I have a functor which is this tensor functor as follows well C. So what does it do for my rows? I also have row tensor row going to row. And so there's a natural transformation, but this is not, so I'll put this in quotes. I'll say what this is in, in, in this type, row x3 tensor x prime. So this tensors over e x prime y prime to row x tensor x prime. So I should probably do a little tensor uh, a sigma tensor cross U tensor and then the sigma two three x x prime y y prime right if I have two morphisms they be f and g are going to f tensor g so if you know what one of the categories I can tensor both matrices is chronic a product right so and then what if it takes four variables so this is something from g up plus g plus g up Cross G to E, and then I have to switch X prime and Y to get this to work out, right? But it's very straightforward. And then this also satisfies the interchange equation.
And so then I can define what a, so then I get the same things and now I'm looking at, um, so now what, what, what are we looking at? We're looking at rho is a unital monoidal uh, monoid. So monoid means I have composition and monoidal means I have this U tensor here. And this is mu tensor and so this was just tensor in C. So that was this function which I call tensor. We call that tensor in C. So uh, so I have this, so I have a unit, and I have this, and I have the interchange relation. And so this gives me in the same fashion what I get it out is a monoid category. And here's a nice example. If my G is the group point S, which has objects, the real, uh, the natural numbers, and has SN action, that's a group void. And then actually these categories are R cross. And that's only a slight lie if the unit is injected. The unit it is split in the story. So I have to have that it's split, so it has to be injected and has to split. So units of split monoidal monoids are what props are. So now you know what a prop is, if you never knew what a prop is. That's a prop. So it has objects, natural numbers, and it has some morphisms between them. And uh, natural numbers have a monoidal structure, which is plus. And so that, that works out fine. So here, uh, it's actually this is a G. So I'll note, I was talking about that, so G is the point. All right, so now I'm very low, so I can't get to opera in time. Uh, but maybe let me let me say one word about opera as where where they live here, and then the final sentence. So for opera ads, you need to know something too. You, you need to figure out that uh, this S, this is the free monoidal on the trivial category. And if you think about free monoidal on something simpler, on basic, I'll just say this. So the notions that you immediately get are Feynman categories and these unique factorization categories that I mentioned at the beginning. And I'll end with a uh, sentence, which is a dream. And then maybe Sasha can help me fulfill my dream. <laughs> So what's the dream? It's the Garrison Harbor McLean dream, I'll call it. It will also be the Gefan Bani dream. That will be also a good dream. <laughs> it's actually my dream. I don't think. Yeah, uh, I should I should talk. So Garrison Harbor in 63, I think he figured out that if I have this thing here, it slides either in the tensor algebra to the n plus one, or maybe in a tensor t a n. So I can take these tensors and I can move stuff around and I can use contractions and I get a lot of mileage out of this. But now I already told you on that board, well, I can do the same thing. I can just take a uh, row box, row box, so this is exactly the box rho. So this is you know the tensor algebra of rho, which is exactly the bar complex of rho rho with with rho itself. So the bar complex is just a tensor algebra. This is about a copy of the bar of rho. Um, and then here I have all these nice operations, right? I have you know the bracket, the pre and you have an expert sitting here, so you can do all this stuff. So you should be able to do this stuff here. You do actually all the stuff you can do, you did here, you can do here. So you will have full shirt actions and so on and so on. And then what about quadratic? 
So you can read some stuff that I wrote with my one of my former student Ben Ward about quadratic functional Feynman categories. But in principle, it means that these so what is an algebra quadratic if it has a quadratic presentation that also has something with the, to do with the tensor algebra. Um, so quadratic actually is the right version here is called cubical, and you can do the same thing. And then you can uh, play all the games. So now I can make this in a, into a mounting dream as well, because now we have you know the black tensor product and the white tensor product in quadratic algebras, and we can take uh, this quantum groups book and just translate it. And that's also where I need the enrichment over E. All right, I'll stop there. Thank you for being this talk. Questions. Okay, I have various things that uh, occur to me, um, and uh, I find this very interesting because uh, for all kinds of reasons. But one of them is it uh, it's, it seems to connect up with the theory that I have to do with, which is bisect functors and bisect categories and things like okay. that. And I I don't know from your perspective how this is related, but um, the, the well, one may define, for instance, of a bisect category, and traditionally this is done where the objects are just groups. But I have a rather recent paper where I'm doing with all finite categories, and um, the morphisms are um, really pro functors. So we do think yeah. we do things where the category, the target category, is sets, but you mm -hmm. probably won't do it with some other right. monoidal category. Um, and so then, in the context of groups, for instance, the the development of the internal product both on the bisect category and then on the category of functors on that category, um, which you can do by means of a co-end and all yes. that stuff. And, and, yeah. and, and this is this is done traditionally. There, for instance, there's a Springer lecture note written by Serge Book, which came out about 10 years ago, okay. where um, it's called something like bisect functors or, or groups or okay. know, something like this. Um, so I admit, you know, more recently, I have been doing the same thing with categories, with finite categories, and it works um, formally just the same way, except you have to be a little bit careful in some, some points. Um, so it seems to me that there may be a lot of, uh, some overlap between what you were yeah. saying and, and this kind of business. Um, I mean, there, there are technicalities, like in, in our situation where we're taking this um, product of the of the by set sort of by modules. I mean, they're not. They, if you the associative law doesn't come for free. You have to work with them up to isomorphism, or else you work with a two category where the yes. you know stuff, presumably you run through the same yes no, I, I swept that into the rug so yeah, yeah, for instance yeah. i was lying here for about the uh, monoidal categories these are strict monoidal categories and the same thing yeah you yeah. can either have associativity or associativity up to an associator and then you get into two category lines exactly yeah yeah um one thing that um that, that i i wonder about is this very unpleasant question which i I'm about to ask you, but people ask me. I, I've had trouble getting my paper accepted so far for publication. The most recent place I sent it to, the, the, the referee um, thought a lot of it was rather trivial. Um, and indeed, the, a lot of the development is formal, yeah. but where can you find it in the literature? You know, right. sort of that, that sort of stuff. But also, the, the referee said, um, you know, what applications do we have? Of this, so if you've got this monoidal structure on these representations, yes, what does it actually do for ah, you? It gives you these bar complexes. I mean, the things I couldn't say is that this immediately gives me two nice things, and maybe the same thing for you. So the first thing is you get. Uh, so this is ha, great question. So um, I didn't get to talk about modules. Um, and all in all, I packed away the good shark, so I should unpack the good shark one. Well, I can't find it. Put it, put it. Uh, if I had, so what's a module? This is a module, but if I have, so alpha now is the functor from G to D. 
And I can, if I just have a factor free, uh, uh, just a functor from G to D, I can take the free row module. This is row box alpha. This is just row box alpha. This is the free row module by multiplication on the left. So that's like one thing you actually get for free. You get free modules for free. And then an interesting question, this is where sort of opera is coming. Uh, you can ask the question, is this, if, if rho and alpha are monoidal, uh, is uh, rho box alpha monoidal? And then the answer is uh, only if a certain equation or only if finite equations. So this is answers the question, what can you do and what can you ask? Now you have two structures. And the other thing you can do is, and this is kind of really cool, um, is if I take another thing you can do, and it, that might actually give you something interesting. So nobody complains about the fact that Kant Kaimas top algebra for renormalization is interesting, or that the half algebra for uh, polylogarithms is uninteresting. Uh, and what I claim is you can do the same thing here. So as you said, so now I take my row as a as a co thing, and then I can define what common climate for the co Hochschild co chain. So this is work with uh, I would have to I still be jobs Yang Long and Pike of they're really smart. I mean, they should have. So, uh, cohesion cohomology. So, uh, they denote the C A star of C C uh, C C, which in degree N is delta epsilon, which is tom C C tensor N. So, you can do the same thing in C H N of uh, rho with rho box N. So, um robots and where hum is now natural transformation. And in here, you get this uh, differential equation. So basically, uh, this is, so this Möbius, this is equivalent to uh, the co-product, the Kankheimer co-product. In the example, so that's an older paper with uh, Imagal West, uh, and he talks to myself. But now we can do this. And so for instance, you get the B plus operator is a wonderful section here. So that's another thing. So here you have, here you have to use this internal hum. Well, this is what you were saying. So let me, let me say how this is an answer to your question. It's if I have these structures, I can play the games like for co-algebras. Here I have this co-endomorphism algebra, if you want. And then that's interesting because just right, dualizing the stuff for operas actually gives you the Kahn-Kleiner half algebra. So you'd have the same thing if you just dualize it. You'll get a bi-algebra structure if you look at both at the same, the monoid. So you, we usually do bi-algebras because we have a second structure, which is this tensor, but the co-algebra works as well. So you have this, and then you have these co co-chains, which are these speed plus operators that are very, very important to solve uh, equations or to bootstrap uh, co-product equations. That's what they do with them. And in one version, it's Kahn and Kleima, and then either for trees or for graphs, and for another version, it's actually the stuff that people look at in polylogs, and that's very set theoretic. So there, it's just a bunch of points in, in, in C, and, and this has just something to do with finite sets. So that you will get also automatically for free. And I think, you know, these things like free algebras, free modules, bar constructions, cobar constructions, that's kind of nice. And this bar cobar adjunction, that's usually what, you know, I claim the algebraic topology group crowd likes. If you can do bar and cobar <laughs> and then say that the thing is free. And then, then the next thing is crucial. Oh, this is really too big. So can I make it smaller? Then, um, that's, I mean, that's when you say free modules, do you mean like representable functors? Is that true, or do you mean something different? The row uh, box A, that's yes. Say that again, row box A is the free, free function. as uh, as left a joint to forget, uh, right? If this so this is representable, in fact, if it's row box or it, was it blank or what? If, so, what is your? Your functor or it's... row box A is a free, uh, a free row module. Row module. 
Just like A pen for M rho is it is this categorical model that Rao was talking about, and then rho box is a row module, the free row module, like A tensor M. Like A tensor M is a free A, a module. Yeah, okay. So yes, it turned out to be the same as a representable functor comes for the I don't know. That's, that, that probably don't go that way right now. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite sure. I mean, if you can, if you can make the two sentences. Yeah. Uh, so the way it's defined here is as the left adjoint of the forgetful functor, right? And if you can tell me, which might be true, but I'm too smart, too stupid. Okay. Okay. That that also means that it's representable. Yes. Then it's fine. I think it's. I think it is actually. Then we should find the by your neighbor's lemma. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah. Oh. Probably yes. <laughs> Okay. I think I think I would I would uh, I thought about this briefly like how to say that or how to prove it in one line didn't get finished but it goes through the adjunction again mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right so it goes through the adjunction and being tensor o or something and then you can just flip one side to the other side you factor you flip the factor of of your module to the other side and then you figure out that this is the unit and then you're done. So we are well over over time so yes. I wouldn't uh, sorry uh, we should uh, close yeah. up questions and though I do have but uh, some questions but I I also want to advertise something for topologists it's like this uh, uh, story of left hand side is also simplicial yes <laughs> it is simplicial yeah. Yeah. it's also simplicial, simplicial uh, it's a structure you define simplicial structure on uh, on this um, uh, triple bar yeah. yeah. As you explained to me earlier, it's not, it's not fine. No, no, it's simplicial, and that thing there is called simplicial. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it turns out it's sim simplicial, and then you can do, I can then say that. So if you look at the, so for anybody still listening now, the bar complex is an opera, it boils down to having level trees. Uh, that's semi-simplicial. If you have units, you can look at the reduced bar complex, and then you'll get unlevel trees. Which is fascinating in its own right because people fight over that a lot. And it's a question between unital and non unital or Marco and May operates. So we can, yeah, have, we can have people fight over this. But <laughs> it's this question is it simplicial or semi simplicial? And am I looking at the bar or the reduced bar complex? Mm -hmm. It's actually pretty cool if you think about it. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. Let's think uh, again around for the very interesting talk. Hopefully, for them.